Thank you, Miss Morgan, for that. You know, there's a lot of truth in that song, church family. There certainly is. The, I mean, just the last couple phrases she said there, I learned to depend upon his word. Hey, when you're going through the trials, sometimes this is all you have. No, come on. This is all you have, but this is all you need. And, and so I just want to uh, uh, just echo that and just say, well, thank you for that, Miss Morgan. That's very, very good. All right, take your Bibles, if you would, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 8. Luke chapter number 8, verse number 26. You should be there by now. Out of honor and respect for reading of his word, let's all stand. Let's stand as we get into the reading and preaching of God's word. <clears throat> Luke chapter number 8, verse number 26. Usually we're, we, on Sunday mornings we go th- we're going through the Gospel of John. And uh, this account right here is not recorded in the Gospel of John. And so we're going to pick up right here, Luke chapter 8, verse number 26. And the Bible says, And they arrived at the country of the Gadareans, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man, which had devils long time, and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of, thou son of God most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For oftentimes it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and fetters, and he brake the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. Verse 30. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to, that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And there was there an herd of many swine feeding on the mountain, and they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them, and he suffered, and he suffered them. Verse 33, Then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. When they that fed them saw that what was done, they, they fled and went and told it in the city and, into the, and in the country. Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They also, which saw it, told them by what means he that was possessed of the devils was healed. Then the whole multitude of the country of the Gadareans round about besought him to depart from them, for they were taken with great fear, and he went up into the ship and returned back again. That's what could have been in the land of Gadara. What could have been. So this message is titled this, His Presence or Your Possessions. His Presence or Your Possessions. And it could, I could add this to the title, What's More Valuable? His Presence or Your Possessions, What's More Valuable? Let's pray, and then you can be seated. Father, as we come before you here this morning, Lord, we want to thank you, dear God, for just once again the, the privilege that it is to be in your house. And Lord, I pray that as your word goes forth this morning, Lord, that you would use it. Father, that you would remove me. And Lord, may, your, may the flock be fed this morning. And Lord, I pray, dear God, that Holy Spirit, that you would convict where conviction is needed. Lord, I pray that you be with my train of thought. I pray that you be with my speech. I pray that you be with my tongue, Lord, and my voice. Lord, where people need to hear from you, dear God. And Lord, I ask you that you would just be in our midst here and that may we leave here knowing that it was a good morning to be in your house. Lord, we thank you for all you've done. In Christ's name I pray, amen and amen. Thank you, you may be seated. I'm sure... I, I have no specific one in mind here, but I'm pretty sure that many of us at one point, at some, at some time, if you own a television or if you watch television at all, you may have seen infomercials or commercials about the newest and latest and greatest product for weight loss. Anybody ever seen those before? Yeah, I'm sure you have. <laughs> And as you, as you watch those programs, and often you know what they'll do, they'll, they'll, pu- they'll push this program and they'll say, hey, if you buy our product, whether it's drinking milkshakes or whether it's an exercise program for 60 days or 90 days, they'll, they'll show one image of a person before and they'll show the picture of the image of the person after they use the product and there is significant change that takes place. 
Now, they may have lost weight or they've gained muscle mass or whatever the case might be. But the big promotion is this. You buy this product and then you can look like this. That, that, that's what they're pushing for. Am I the only one who ever watches that or ever seen that before? Uh, I, I guess I am, but th- hey, that's okay. So, and so what the idea is, so the average consumer, they'll watch that and they'll say, I want to look like that. I want to look like that, especially around the new year. Uh, people have resolutions and they might say to themselves, I'm going to be disciplined in, in what I eat or I'm going to be disciplined in, with this, this, this product here. And they, they, they purchase the product and, and then when they purchase the product, they open up the instructions and then all of a sudden they're, they're reading all the details and it says this, you must abstain from these types of foods. They didn't say that in the commercial. They said, I could eat whatever I want. They said, I could eat whatever I want, and, and, and I'll, look, I'll look fit. And, or they'll say, you need to abstain from, from salts, or they, you need to abstain from, uh, from carbs, or you need to abstain from sweets, you need to abstain from cakes and hot dogs and hamburgers and all the fun stuff you got to stay away from. You say you need to abstain from these types of things. And what people will often do is, now I, I'm sure that they'll, they'll buy the product and, and they'll even probably follow the diet regimen, uh, whatever, I don't, I don't know what I'm trying to say, the recipe, whatever. And so they'll actually follow it for a while, but they'll, for, if it's a 90-day program, they might follow it for maybe a month or so, and then they realize, oh, this is too hard. <laughs> this is too hard, this is too difficult. So you know what I'm going to do? I think I'm happy the way I am. It's a whole lot more fun the way I am. <laughs> and so, but here's the thing. They, they, they want the product without the sacrifice. They want the product, but they're not willing to make the sacrifice to cut out the sweets. They want the product. They, they, they want to have, you, you know, the muscles. They want to be fit. They want to be lean. They want to be in shape. They want all that, but they're not willing to make the sacrifices that are needed of cutting out the burgers, or cutting out the cheesecake, Oh, heaven forbid, cut out cheesecake. Ooh. Or cut out, you know, the good stuff. Hey, you know, I, I use that as an illustration to kind of grasp our minds in, in this realm here. Hey, a lot of people, they want the blessings of God, but they're not willing to make the sacrifices for the blessings of God. I'm pretty sure if I asked anybody here, how many of you want the blessings of God in your life? I'm sure hands all over would go completely just clear throughout the auditorium here this morning. But the fact of the matter is, we want the blessings of God, but the truth is, many believers are not willing to make the sacrifices for the blessings of God. You know, in our text this morning, Jesus, he blesses the country of the Gadareans with his presence. Look at verse number 26 there. He says, and they arrived at the country of the Gadareans, which is over against Galilee. Well, Brother Richard, why do you say that he blesses the country with his presence? Well, this is Jesus we're talking about. This is the Lord we're talking about here. I'm pretty sure that if the Lord Jesus Christ descended from heaven and walked in through the doors of Calvary Baptist Church, we would feel blessed that he's even here. And so here's the Lord Jesus, and he, he's, he's sailing the, across the sea, and then he steps on the shores of, of the, the Gadareans there, of the, the shores of Gadara, and Gadara was a town or a village in a region of Decapolis, which, made up, was, which was made up by 10 other villages and 10 other cities, small cities. And the Gadareans was a, was a society where mixed multitudes would dwell. Meaning this, that there would be Jews and Gentiles living amongst one another there. And now, the stricter Jews, they would strongly believe that's a no-no. The strict religious Jews would say, no, 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 we don't go to that region. The reason why we don't go to that region is because the law says that we're not supposed to uh, uh, be around unclean things. And what the Gadareans would often do is that you would have Jews and Gentiles uh, living amongst one another. And oftentimes the Jews would work under the Gentiles and the Jews would feed their swine. They would feed their pigs. Now, according to Old Testament law, to the Jews, I'd say that's an unclean animal. We're not supposed to even be around that. We're not even supposed to touch that. And so, regardless of how the culture felt about the Gadarean people, Jesus still had a purpose to go there. And what's his purpose? Listen, his purpose has always been, always been, seek and to save that which was lost. Regardless of how the culture felt another people group, regardless of how they felt, regardless of how the religious leaders felt about another people group, 
Jesus, no doubt, he would always go to be about his father's business. And no doubt, if he were to go there, he was to preach the kingdom unto them and to interact with people and with the whole intention of this, changing their lives for the better. And not just changing their lives, but church, changing their eternity. So here he is. Jesus, he, he steps off the boat in the land of Gadara. And he, his disciples are with them. And Jesus is approached by a man who is possessed with devils. Look at verse 27. And he went forth to land. There met him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time and wear no clothes, neither abode in, in, abode in any house but in the tombs. So what a greeting. Jesus, he steps off the boat, steps onto the shores of Gadara, and the first person to greet him is this. A demon-possessed man. Well, that's a fun greeting. Hey, hey listen. Demon possession is real, church. It's real. I know Hollywood tries to glamorize it. I know Hollywood tries to portray it as something fascinating. But I want to tell you right now, it is very, very, very real. And we should abstain from that. We certainly should. This man, he was a demon-possessed man, and he dwelt among the dead. He lived with the tombs. He was fascinated with the dead. Hey, you know, Hollywood tries to portray fascinations with the dead and the goth and zombies. Hey, I'm just telling you, that's not of God. That's not of God. And, and, and this demon-possessed man, he was fascinated with, with, with the dead there. And, and you've got to make one wonder, if, if those thoughts didn't come from God, then where did those thoughts come from? Where do those ideas come from that Hollywood tries to portray? Come on, church. I, I, I know the world says it's entertaining, but we, let's take a biblical pr perspective from this. Hey, if, if this is not of God, then where does it come from? The scripture also leads us to believe that this man was a menace. In verse number 29, it speaks about how he would be bound with chains and he would break them. I mean, that goes to tell me that the, 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 the residents there of that area, they would try to capture him, try to get a hold of him, and they would try to bind him up. But because of his strength, because of demon possession, he would be able to break these chains as though they were really nothing. The Bible says that he was unclothed. He was immodest. The Bible says that he would, uh, inf uh, the Bible tells us that he would take stones and, and inflict himself and cut himself. Hey, listen, self-infliction is not of God. If it's not of God, then where does it come from? Come on, church. I'm not trying to insult your intelligence here, but we see a man here who is influenced by evil, who is influenced by the devils, and no doubt, no doubt there are people today who are, who, are, who are struggling with their lives and they're fascinated with the realms of the dead and the reality of death. And there are people today who, who cut themselves, who injure themselves, who, who, who put their bodies through torment. And, and listen, if that's not of God, then where does that come from? We, ser the, the, we, we serve a savior, no doubt, but there is an adversary, the devil. And he is the prince and power of the air. And he does have an, an, an influence on people today. Come on, don't look at me like I'm strange. Verse 28, read that, it says, When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. Okay, now, now, now come back to me here. This man, uncontrollable. People try to gather him, people try to restrain him, he break the chains. This man was a menace. This man was a nuisance to society. This man who would live amongst the dead. This man who would cut himself. This man who was immodest, who, who would, who, without clothing. And then he's constantly running around. But he sees Jesus, and this is what the Bible does. The Bible says that he falls down at his feet. Hey, listen, the one who is uncontrollable, these demons, they know exactly who Jesus is. Hey, listen, church family, sometimes we get so proud that we're not willing to humble ourselves and get low before God, but even the devils know that they're supposed to humble themselves. Even the devils know that Jesus is worthy of worship. Even the devils know that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. And listen, um, as powerful as they are and as strong as they may be, they tremble at our Savior. Hey, if, if we can just like for somehow put on some spiritual goggles, and look into the realm of the spiritual. 
you look at one demon and we all be terrified. We look at one and we'd be running the other direction. Jesus, or excuse me, they, 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 say to the, they say, I beseech thee, torment me not. This demon-possessed man, he looks at Jesus, and according to verse 31, it tells us that they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. You, you know, that, that's kind of referencing there. They're, they're thinking this, it's judgment day. These demons thought it was judgment day. Hey, there will be a day when Jesus deals with them. There will be a day when they're, when they're cast into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. You, you, hear, them, you hear what I'm saying? There will be a day when Jesus deals with them. And, and they're saying, torment, torment me not. Now, now listen, there will be a day when Jesus is judge, but it wasn't that day. Jesus wasn't there to be judge yet because he will judge and then in verse number 30 he, he asks their name look at verse 30 jesus asked him saying what is thy name and he said legion because many devils were entered into him hey remember how i said if we were just put on some spiritual goggles and look into the realm of the spiritual and if we take a peek at one demon take a peek at one demon we all be terrified hey we fool ourselves and we kid ourselves greatly if we, if we think we'd be fascinated with them. We fool ourselves and we deceive ourselves and thinking, wow, this is exciting. Oh, this is really neat. Oh, this is really cool. No, no, no. We take a peek at one and no doubt we are trembling for sure. Jesus asks, what's your name? He says, legion, because there are many devils. Hey, a, a legion would represent, a listen, a number between 2,000 and 6,000 Roman soldiers. Legion. So not only did this man just have one possession, no, no, we're talking upwards of two, in between 2,000 to 6,000 demons inside this man. But regardless of how many of they were, they all knew Jesus was in charge. <laughs> it was Jesus lands on the shore of Gadara for the sole purpose of doing his father's work. He's being about his father's business. He's come across a man who was demon-possessed, cut himself, no clothing, a terror amongst society. And here's the thing, Jesus is going to start with him. Look at verse number 32. And there was a herd, excuse me, and there, and there was a herd of many swine feeding on the mountain. And they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them, and he suffered them. So here are these devils. These demons were legion, 2,000, 6,000 demons, and they're trembling at the feet of Jesus. They are low, they're, they're, they're a position of worship, and they're trembling and saying, hey, don't, don't judge us just yet, Lord. Don't, don't, throw us into, don't throw us into the lake of fire just yet, but bid us to go into the swine. Let us to go into the pigs of Gadara. Let us go into them, and for whatever reason, I, I mean, I'm not the Lord, and neither are you, but the Lord permitted it. The Lord allowed it. The Lord allowed them to go into the swine. And for the very first time in who knows how long, this maniac of Gadara, who was outside of his mind, had complete and utter peace of mind. Those swine, they, they, they go, in, 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 or the, those demons, they go into the swine. And the Bible tells us that they ran off a steep place. They ran into a lake. And then as I can just imagine, maybe there was 2,000 demons. Maybe there was 2,000 pigs. Maybe there were 6,000 demons. Maybe there were 6,000 pigs. That is a lot of sausage and bacon, for crying out loud. But they go in there, and they, 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 they fall off into a steep place, into a lake. And as far as the eye can see, just little feet upward. They choked, the Bible says. We know the account. I'm not going to say a story because it really happened. It's an account. They drowned. And for the first time, and who knows how long, this man who is un uncontrollable is in a right state of mind. This man who would afflict himself and cut himself and change the, his outward appearance with scars was for the first time is in a right state of mind once again. He was under control. The Bible says that he was clothed. <laughs> I think it's safe to say that everything that Jesus did, the moment he stepped off the boat, he's done nothing but good 
in the land of Gadara. The moment he stepped off the boat, I mean, the moment his foot touched the sands of Gadara, no doubt, I mean, he blessed it with his presence. A maniac that was there. He cast out these demons that were trembling into the swine. He healed this man. Not only did he benefit the man, but he also benefited society because this man was a menace to the society. So he was being a blessing to everybody all the way around. And then as soon as we would think that the people would be singing Jesus' praises, this is what happens. A protest is gathered against him. What? So where was wrong and where was bad in the events of what Jesus just did? There is none. But a protest had gathered against him. Those who had fed the swine had informed the city, those in the city of what had happened. I mean, can you imagine? The person who was feeding the pigs, feeding them their slop. I'll never forget when I was in, I think it was second grade, uh, 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 Miss Laura Dinas was my Sunday school teacher. She brought slop to show me what pigs ate. Never forgot it. Scarred for life. <laughs> no. I can just imagine they're, they're feeding the pigs and all of a sudden these pigs, they started acting up. And then all of a sudden, they're just stampeding. And the person who's feeding them just saw them just go off a cliff. And they all drowned. The Bible tells us that the person who fed them, they went into the cities and to the countries and explained what had happened. Now look at verse 35. It says, and they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. Now listen to these last words. And they were afraid. What? They're afraid? Why would they be afraid? I mean, everything that Jesus had done was good. Those that came to the city had come. They'd seen a man who was in his right state of mind again. This man who was terrorizing people, he was in his right state of mind. This man who was immodest and who was naked, he was clothed for the first time in a long time. And now all of a sudden, these people, they see what's going on, and they're afraid of him? They're afraid of Jesus? Why were they afraid? I believe this, because they saw Jesus as more as a nuisance than anything. You know what they're thinking? This is what they're thinking. Jesus, you just killed our livestock. You hear that? Jesus, you just destroyed our income. Jesus, you just destroyed our economy. You you just took away our possessions. Do you understand that? Do you understand what you did, Jesus? And so, I mean, think of it. The, the, these owners of, of the swine, they go and they see a man who is a terror, and they saw a man who is possessed by the devils, and then he's clothed and he's in his right state of mind. It would just make us think, maybe we should accept him. <laughs> maybe we should accept Christ. Maybe, we should, maybe what, him being here is a good thing, but they didn't see that as a good thing. You know what they saw? They saw their prophets floating out in the lake. That's what they saw. And they, they looked at Jesus and they said, what are you doing, Jesus? You just completely destroyed our source of income. So and then the Bible tells us this, that, that the, the, oh, oh, verse 37, and then the whole, multi, whole multitude of the country of the Gadareans round about besought him to depart from them, for they were taken with great fear, and he went up into the ship and returned back again. Hey, listen, rather than rejoicing that the Messiah was there, Rather than rejoicing that Jesus the Savior was there, rather than rejoicing in the fact that Jesus the Savior had already healed a man, rather than rejoicing in the fact that Jesus was there to change people's lives, this is what they said, in essence, now I'm paraphrasing this, Jesus, you're bad for business, go back to where you came from. That was it. You're bad for business. You destroyed our income. You destroyed our livelihood. You destroyed our economy. I think the Bible says something about the love of money being what? Root of all evil. They're more concerned about their income. They're more concerned about their pigs. They're more concerned about their possessions. You know what they thought? They thought, Jesus, you're going to mess up our lives if you stick around here. How different Gadara could have been. How different it could have been had they accepted the Savior right then and there. I mean, he could have performed miracles amongst people. 
He could have had sweet fellowship with them. Uh, who knows what kind of life-changing experiences that they could have had with him. No doubt he would have done miracles. Uh, but they thought this, if it means losing my business, if your presence means that I lose my possessions, if it means I lose my business, if it, lose, if it means I lose my income, then Jesus, get back in your boat and go back to where you came from. That's what they were saying. The Gadareans besought Jesus to leave because they believed that his presence would cost them something of great value. Listen, they weren't willing to give up what they valued most for his presence. Did you hear that? Now, let me ask you. Are you willing to give up what you value most for his presence? Now, wake up. Are you willing to give up what you value most for his presence? Hey, listen. With his presence, there's blessings. With his presence, there's security. With his presence, there's strength. With his presence, there's endurance. With his presence. But here's the thing. Are you willing to give up what you value most for his presence? Hey, I believe that there are many Christians who respond the same way that the Gadareans did. And church, let that not be said of us here this morning. Because, hey, we can miss out on the Lord blessing us in our lives if we're not careful. Hey, I want God's blessings for your life. I want God's blessings for your marriage. I want God's blessings for your kids. I want God's blessings for your grandkids. Is everybody with me this morning? Come on, come on, let's wake up here. Each and every one of us desires the blessings of God in our lives and for our children, for our grandchildren, absolutely. But if we're not careful, we can miss it, ladies and gentlemen. You and I can miss out on the Lord's blessings in our lives, listen, if we choose to value our possessions more than his presence in our lives. We all want the blessings of God. We all do. I want the blessings of God on this church. I do. And, and if the blessings of God are come upon this church, then that means the blessings of God are going to come upon you. Because we're the church. This building isn't the church. No, 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 we're the church. And, and, and I want God's blessings to be upon your homes. I want God's blessings to be upon our lives and our families' lives. But when we begin to, or excuse me, but when God begins to work in our lives, sometimes through the preaching and teaching of his word, God will begin to bring some things into our lives, or to our attention, excuse me, not our lives, but bring some things to our attention. And he'll say this, do you value this more than my presence? Do you value whatever it is more than my presence in your life? And when the Holy Spirit of God convicts, and when the Holy Spirit of God brings some things to our minds, we are so often quick to do this, okay? Lord, I want your blessings, but don't touch my swine. I want your blessings, but those are my pigs. I want your blessings, but don't take away my entertainment. Come on. I want your blessings, but, 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 but don't take away don't take away my leisure. Don't take away my downtime. I, I, I want your blessings, God. I, I, hey, I want your blessings on this church, but don't take away, oh, I feel like I'm going to get in a lot of trouble here, but don't take away my Saturday mornings. Don't take away the opportunity for me to outreach. I love my Saturday morning. No, don't take that away. I, I, I want you to bless, but don't take away the relationships that I know that are hurting me more than helping me. Don't take those away. Hey, listen, church. We serve a really good God. And we serve a really good God who really wants to bless your life. And I'm not saying bless your life by you winning the lotto. Okay, I'm not saying that he's going to bless your life and, and take away all your problems. No, no, no. He blesses your life because you have his presence. And his presence, listen, his presence is worth more than the entertainment that you're not willing to give up. His presence is worth more than the, his relationship is a whole lot greater than the relationship that you want to have, that your flesh longs for, that your flesh desires to have. His relationship is much greater than the relationships that we can have here. It is. His presence is so much greater. Hey, hey, I want your presence, but, 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 but let me keep my whatever it is. 
You know, when we, when we argue with God and we say no over and over and over again. Now, let me have your attention here. Don't, 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 don't zone out here. When we, when we say no to God, it's a whole lot easier to say no the next time and the next time and the next time and the next time. Hey, listen, it's not that God doesn't want to bless your life. It's just that he can't bless your life because we're not willing to let go of our swine. We're not willing to let go of our possessions. We're not willing to let go of our, I don't know, our entertainment. If the Holy Spirit of God might be speaking to you about your, your clothing and your wardrobe or whatever. And we're not, God, I want your blessings, but don't take away my wardrobe. God, I want your blessings, but don't take away my YouTube. God, I want your blessings, but don't take away my movies. God, I want your blessings, but don't take this away or don't take that away. Don't take, don't take away my swine. Hey, listen, is your swine so important that you're willing to miss out on the presence of God in your life? Is it really that important? What do you value most? What do you value most? God, I want your, I want your blessings, but don't take away my party life. God, I want your blessings, but don't take away my alcohol. Come on, church. God, I want your blessings, but don't take away my swine. You know, when, when, when you argue with God, you know, this is basically what we're saying. Now, look, let me have your attention. This is basically what we're saying. When we're not willing to give up what he wants us to give up, we are saying this to him. Lord, you're bad for business. So go back to where you came from. And you read it. That's exactly what he did. He got back in his boat and he went back to where he came from. You know what that means for us? The Lord's given you a free will. The Lord's given you a free will and he's given you the ability to choose his presence or your possessions. And you get to choose what you value most. Our Lord will not force himself on anyone. Did you hear my voice? He will not force himself on you. He won't. He wants you to actually love him. He wants you to choose to love him. He wants you to choose him over your alcohol. He wants you to choose him over your entertainment. He wants you to choose him over your bitterness. He wants you to choose him over whatever the case it might be. He wants you to choose him over your tobacco. He wants you to choose him over drugs. He wants you to choose him over your immoral relationship. But when we say, no, dear God, I'm not going to do that, we are saying this to him, get back in your boat. You're bad for my business. You're going to mess up my life. Now, what in the world what, 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 what kind of ignorance do we must have to be on to think that if we allow his presence in our lives that he's going to mess it up? No, 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 no. We do that all on our own. We don't, <laughs> we need God in our life to, to rearrange and to fix our lives and he's certainly not going to mess it up. But you have a choice. What are you going to choose? What do you value most? His presence or your possessions. Each and every one of us have a choice. Now, I don't know what the Lord's speaking to your heart about. I have no idea. But there might be something in your life. There might be something in your heart that God has spoken to you over and over and over and over and over and over. You know why God speaks to you over and over and over again? Because he loves you. Because he loves you. He wants to bless but his blessings will com are completely dependent on if you are willing to let go of your possessions. Drown your swine. I should have named it that title. Drown your pigs. It's not worth it. His presence in your life is so much more valuable than whatever it is that you think is important, that you think is worth holding on to, that you deceive yourself into believing, I have to have it. No comparison. His presence or your possessions. And he will, he will let you choose. You want him to leave you alone? He will leave you alone. He will go back to where he came from. And you will live with the choice that you make. Yeah. His presence or your possessions. What do you, what does Calvary Baptist Church value most? What do we value?
Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you, dear God, for this morning that you've given us. Lord, it's truly our desire.